Welcome. Welcome everyone, really glad you're here. Uh, I have been anticipating this seminar for weeks. Uh, this is my dear friend, Deacon Rob Sorensen. He's a historian, teacher by trade, and he knows his stuff. So it's wonderful to sit at his, sit at his feet and um, learn more about the Book of Common Prayer. I feel like I owe everyone in attendance an apology for the lack of aesthetic grandeur in this room. <laughs> so we're gonna to tour a different cathedral known as the Book of Common Prayer, and hopefully that'll win the day. I also wanna to apologize for our audio system. We have been trying four months now to root out all the gremlins and uh, technological difficulties. Have we attempted an exorcism? We have not. We Anglicans do that. So um, just bear with us. It will cut in and out inevitably. It'll work for a long time. You'll be like, it's fixed, and then it won't work. So we're aware of the problem. I apologize in advance. Uh, why don't I open us in a word of prayer? How good and right it is, Lord, when brothers and sisters in Christ live together in unity. And I thank you for the Canterbury House and the way that it is a way for us to come together and, and reason together, learn from each other, and hopefully uh, align our hearts and minds more with you. So I thank you for your servant, Rob. I thank you for his faithful witness and service to this community that spans uh, nearly, if not a decade in length. Bless him, uh, inspire his words, by your Holy Spirit, in Christ's name, amen. Before I pass the mic, uh, does anyone, is anyone interested in uh, a liturgical calendar? We passed these out last week. Maybe if you could just raise your hand, I'll bring them by. They're free, and uh, they're a wonderful resource. Rob, welcome. Glad to hear. Well, thanks, Jeremiah. That was a, a, a very generous introduction. And, and uh, I'm excited about this because um, the prayer book, I've been um, using it for a number of years as a source of private pressure. It's been very Oh, there goes, cutting in and out, oh my goodness, the gremlins of the system. Uh, it's been very meaningful to me as a, as a piece of devotional um, kind of tool. Um, it is also the, the sort of central sort of document of our Anglican worship and liturgy. Um, and it is also um, kind of read up my academic field. So I am a, I'm a historian and my, my primary um, sort of academic field is the European Reformation. And the Common Prayer Book, the prayer book is a artifact of that Reformation. So I'm very excited to give you this. I have prepared a little PowerPoint slide deck because that's what we do because we're in the Northwest and we, we love our tech. Um, so I've got, I'm gonna, here's my prayer book here. I, I have several because um, I, guess, I guess when you get ordained, you, you start to collect prayer books. Um, so this is a book of common prayer. We use this uh, not not as a physical book, but the liturgy that we use in, at Advent comes from the prayer book. Um, and let's kind of get a sense of exactly what the prayer book is. So um, so it's a prayer book, and, and prayer books are not you know, they were not uncommon in uh, the Middle Ages um, in the church. Um, prayer books are just a, they're sort of a unifying tool. They're a tool for both private devotion um, and also for sort of corporate worship in the church. And the idea of the prayer book is that the congregation, the people, are praying in the same way, in the same form, right? Uh, and it gives you a sense that you are praying with the community of saints, the community of saints at large, that you're praying in the same prayers, you're praying in the same order, you're praying the same kinds of things with them. And it also provides for both congregations and individuals guidance for those who don't know how to pray or don't know what to pray, right? Sometimes we're not uh, well equipped for extemporaneous prayer and we need a little, little tool for that. Um, so it is in the prayer book tradition. There were lots and lots of prayer books. In fact, there still are lots and lots of prayer books. I, I brought, I walk right in front of my slide. I, I, I brought, this is a non-Book of Common Prayer prayer book that I happen to have. It's called about my vision, and I have several of these as well. So there's lots of different kinds of prayer books, which are just books of, of prayers and services for people and for congregations to use. Okay, this prayer book is called Common. It is the Book of Common Prayer, not because it's like ordinary and not special, um, but because it is for all of the people. Right, Common is 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 for universal. Right? Um, and one of the hallmarks of this prayer book is it is the first kind of comprehensive prayer book to be written in the English language. 
Um, and so prior to the English Reformation, uh, in England, the prayer books tended to be in Latin, and that was great if you were a scholar, if you studied Latin, if you were in the upper classes and you knew that. It was less great if you were not educated in Latin, because then it's very mysterious and you don't you know, know what's going on. Um, but if it's written in English, everyone can participate. So it is common because it's for everyone. Okay. It is also, I mean, this is the, the foundation of all Anglican liturgy and practice, and it has been since the 16th century. This is where our church services come from. So when we go upstairs in an hour and we participate in the divine liturgy together, it comes from the prayer book. That's where those words and that's where those actions, that's where those orders come from. Um, it is the foundation of the way that the, the church service is structured. It's also the foundation of the way that we do sort of a lot of personal devotions. Right? It is also um, just a work of literary art. It is, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, service. The uh, original author, a guy named Thomas Cranmer, who will come at in a moment, um, was a well-educated scholarly literary guy who produced some prayers and some services that are of great literary value. Um, it is um, the Oxford English Dictionary. These are the OED. This is massive English dictionary, and it cites all kinds of works of literature. And there are um, there are certain works that are massively cited. And uh, the Book of Common Prayer is the third most cited text in the OED, after uh, the Bible, the King James Bible, and uh, the works of Shakespeare. Um, and it's actually the second most if you like parse out Shakespeare into individual works. Um, so it's it's the King James Bible, Shakespeare, and the prayer book that really are the foundation of English as a as a literary language. So in addition to its sort of religious functions and religious structures, it is a a literary piece. I, I you know I, I want to work in the microphone for our friends who are not here and the recording and stuff. Um, I feel like I can project to the yes. room for most people. We're going to try and work with the mic. Um, so it's beautiful. Uh, there, and I probably don't need to, to, to say these things because you're a relatively sophisticated group of people. But there, there's a couple of things that it is that it is not, and, and we'll just emphasize where, where the prayer is not. So the prayer is not authoritative, at least in the same sense that the Bible is authoritative, right? So I want to set set those two things uh, aside from one another. Right? The prayer is not the Bible. Um, it has a level of authority. Um, it is the sort of um, authorized services for the Anglican Communion, but um, you don't want to use the prayer book to defend doctrine, right? You don't want to you don't want to set the prayer book as something that you're ultimately following. Right? We're ultimately following Christ and the Bible, so the prayer book is is of what I would call like secondary or limited authority. Um, the next thing, um, the, the prayer book is not. I put it here. It's not a magical talisman, right? We we read Harry Potter and like. You know, Hermione's like, wait, if you say, if you say the spell right, it's going to work, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And there's, there's a temptation sometimes with the prayer book, because the prayer book has got prayers for, um, you know, prayer for rain, and, you know, prayer for healing, and sometimes there's a temptation to be like, well, if I, if I say this right prayer that's in the prayer book, right, God's going to listen to it more um, than some other form of prayer, and that's absolutely not what the prayer book is for. It is not. The prayer book is not because God wants certain kinds of prayers from us, right? The prayer book is for our benefit in helping us um, to pray better. It's not for God. Um, and the last thing, and we'll, we'll hit on this in a minute, it's, it's not actually a single uh, text. There are dozens and dozens of sort of additions and um, variants on the prayer book. Um, they all share a family resemblance. They're all related to one another. Um, but so, so it's a, the prayer book um, is is not a thing, right? There are prayer books that are all sort of built off of the same the same DNA. Um, and a good way to get into kind of how all those prayer books came about is a little bit of the history. Um, so historic. This is my my uh, my field here. So I'll, I'll try and be uh, concise. This is my man, Thomas Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer was the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury originally under Henry VIII when Henry VIII was. Um, beginning the English Reformation and breaking the English Church away from Rome. Um, Henry VIII, was, he was not a um, particularly Protestant fellow. You may know the story. He was more interested in political power and his inheritance than he was in doctrine. Um, and so he broke away from Rome uh, for sort of quotidian political purposes. 
But Cranmer was, was not. Cranmer was, was convinced by the Protestant Reformation. He had lived in Europe, in the Lutheran bits of Europe for a while. And uh, when Henry dies and his young son Edward becomes king of England, Cranmer began the process of what we might call like Protestantizing the Church of England and bringing in the great doctrines of the Continental Reformation, of justification by faith, the priesthood of all believers. Um, and so Cranmer, under Edward, there's my English Reformation. So under King Edward in 1549. There we go. Oh, this is. I don't know if it sounds as weird to y'all, but when I'm up here talking, I'm like, I hear myself, hear myself, oh, there I go. Um, I hope you'll all forgive me. In 1549, under uh, Edward the Sixth, Cranmer writes the first prayer book. And it's in English, it is a particularly Protestant prayer book. And it is intended for the churches in England to be able to transition from what was Roman Catholic, the kind of um, doctrines there, into a particularly Protestant form of worship, particularly Protestant doctrine. Um, and Cranmer believed that this was, this was, um, well, we'll talk about Lex already, but Cranmer believed that the way to do this was not by imposing sort of doctrinal standards, but by worshiping together, by worshiping in a particularly Protestant way. He prioritized um, praying and singing and having services together over what one might call like catechesis, strict like teaching these doctrines and to adhere to these things academically or intellectually. Um, following this, there was a law that was passed in England, right, right coterminous with the, the first prayer book. It's called the Act of Uniformity. There's there are actually several Acts of Uniformity throughout English history. And, and what the Acts of Uniformity are, they're, they're, they're laws that say, well, this is the official prayer book to follow. Um, and you have to follow this particular prayer book. And so starting in 1549, the Church of England was sort of mandated to follow Cranmer's particular English Protestant prayer book. Um, and then you get a hundred years in England where there's uh, sort of religious turmoil and they kind of bounce back and forth between being pretty, pretty aggressively Protestant. Mary restores Catholicism for a while. Queen Elizabeth tries to balance out these things. Uh, people fight over the prayer books. The prayer book was the source of a number of actual like, military conflicts in England about who gets to choose which prayer book there is. Right? And ultimately, following the conclusion of the English Civil War, um, in 1662, the church says, this is well happened. Cranmer is dead by, by, by now. I, I didn't close Cranmer's book. He was actually executed by Queen Mary. Um, it's a sort of a heroic tale, but not for right now. And uh, so in 1662, we're looking at 100 years later, after the English Civil War, uh, which was fought in some part over what kind of prayer book should we follow. Should we follow a very sort of high church prayer book, or should we follow a very um, sort of Puritan style prayer book? Um, 1662, um, there is an official prayer book, a formal prayer book that is uh, a, a middle path, trying to get a middle path between what is sort of high church and low church, mid church. And this is the prayer book that is the source of all other prayer books. I have a copy of it here. It's the Greek prayer book. Um, it's lovely, it's beautiful reading, and it's a little bit like reading the King James Bible. The language is lovely, but a little bit archaic. Um, and this becomes the official book of common prayer. Um, and it is the official book of common prayer, the, the source book, the kind of authoritative liturgy in the Anglican communion to this day. The 1662 prayer book, GAFCON, the global what is GAFCON? Say? Global F, Global Anglican Futures Conference, I believe, which is one of the um, sort of precursors of the ACNA. The the Jerusalem Declaration that GAFCON passed says this of the 1668 prayer book. It calls it a true and authoritative standard of worship and prayer to be translated and locally adapted for each culture. And so and this was. 2008, the Jerusalem Declaration. So up until this day, the 1662 prayer book is seen as the, the source, the anchor, right, the, the ur text of the prayer book. Okay. Um, and I mentioned about Cranmer, right? Cranmer, one of the things that Cranmer says is that worshiping together, praying together, serving together is, is the foundation for 
um, doctrine together. It's a foundation for being together. And that doesn't minimize the importance of doctrine or the intellect, but we pray first, we believe second, said Kramer. The, the fancy Latin term to impress your friends with about this is lex orandi, lex credendi, right? The law that is prayed is the law that is believed, right? And as we worship and as we pray together, those, those rhythms and those words, and the, the scripture that's in the liturgy comes to be at home in our souls and be at home in our lives, and it transforms us. And that, that worship is what starts the process. It doesn't replace doctrine, but it starts that process. Uh, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Ron Williams, great scholar, says this about the prayer book. He says, the prayer book is less the expression of doctrinal consensus and more the creation of a doctrinal and devotional climate. And so the prayer book is there to um, help us to um, worship together and form our hearts and souls. Um, so that's how the prayer book came to be, the 1662 prayer book, which is still sort of authoritative. Um, but let's talk about some other editions here. So 1662, this is the official authoritative edition. Um, all other editions are derived. This, is, I have a modern printing of this. If you're interested in the prayer book, this will cost you like 20 bucks. It's from who it publishes it's IVP. Um, it's a beautiful little book. And worthwhile, worth, worth kind of thinking about and seeing. It's, it's, a, it's very historical. Um, and other prayer books are built off of this, and there's dozens of them. Um, and here's the, here's the big deal ones. So um, the first American version of the prayer book, the 1928 prayer book, I don't have a copy of this one, um, but this is, this is still in use by certain very, very traditional Anglican parishes. It, for some Anglicans, it's a mark of their sort of, we are, we are strictly resisting the modern world and the sexual revolution and all of those terrible things that happened in the 20th century by sticking to the 28th prayer book, which is a great prayer book. It's very, very traditional. It is still um, occasionally in use. But in 1979, there was a more modern version of the American prayer book. That is this one here. It is, this is the version that we use um, at Advent. Um, and so it is, uh, the language is modernized. In fact, the 79 prayer book contains both a traditional text and a modern text for most of the uh, services and prayers in there. So you can choose the sort of higher language or the more quotidian language. Um, and this is what we use. And I am not 100% certain why, the, why we use this one, save for the fact that it was the sort of standard universal edition when this church began its worship. Um, and you can talk to Father Aaron about if he has other thoughts about the 79 prayer book, but it is what we use. There is a newer version of the prayer book though. It is uh, the 2019 version. It was published by the Anglican Church of North America. I have this lovely leather bound copy. I mean, actually, I think it's fake leather. Um, but this 2019 was um, developed by the Anglican Church of North America, our denomination as a way of having um, our own prayer book. And the differences with the 79 prayer book are uh, modest at best. Um, it's a little bit different in its language, it's a little bit different in the way that it uh, frames certain theological questions, but there's nothing, I think, that is very consequential between the two. It's a newer version from the ACNA. So these are our, our sort of um, variety of versions of the prayer book. Okay. Um, so that's where we're at, right? We've got a prayer book. We've got several prayer books. Oh, I also, um, did I put the next, I should have put another bullet point down here because um, we don't want to be like sort of America-centric here because uh, the prayer book is, these are the American editions, right? Or the North American editions at least. Um, but everywhere where there are Anglicans, there are prayer books. And those prayer books in other countries are differently adapted to the local customs and the local habits. So like there's an Australian prayer book that has um, particularly Australian things. Um, there are prayer books in all the African um, Anglican churches. And of course we use, um, sometimes in our liturgy, where we raise the cross, right? We, we cast them to the cross of Christ. That I believe comes from, is it the Kenyan prayer book? Do you know Jeremiah? Yeah, so it's the Kenyan prayer book. So there's prayer books all over the world that are adapted to the, the sort of local culture, the local the local traditions. Um, so these are American prayer books, but you'll find prayer books all over the place. And you'll find the uh, Anglican prayer book translated into other languages. There's a French edition of the prayer book 
I don't read French, so I don't know if it's very good, but um, it's in all the, all the corners of the world the prayer book is gone. All right, so what's in the prayer book? Um, this is very small for everyone's eyes to read, so you'll just have to trust me that there are, there are, <laughs> there are words on the screen. Um, but so uh, this is the table of contents of the uh, 79 prayer book, and it shows the kinds of things that we're going to find in the prayer book. The prayer book contains things that are intended for sort of corporate use and things that are intended for private use, right? Um, so your own your own prayer book, you'll use certain bits of it. You probably won't, for instance, ever have the opportunity, you know, to be using the service for the ordination of a bishop in your own private devotions. Um, so there's lots of stuff in there. And so I'm going to go over kind of the, the highlights here. So um, the piece that's probably most relevant for private use for daily devotions is the daily office. So there are... Um, prayers for different parts of the day that are intended to be used either privately or in small groups um, as sort of uh, regular daily devotional texts. Okay. Um, there are a whole number of services for corporate worship. Um, so this is where our um, uh, basic Sunday service comes from, these corporate worship bits. Um, and it's, you know, you've got special days, right? So you've got liturgies for Palm Sunday and for the great vigil of Easter, okay? You've got various kinds of, of additional services that are in there for corporate worship. These, again, are things that um, we use as a church. You probably don't use those privately for your devotions. There's also um, a whole series, it's called the Ordinal, and a whole series of um, uh, uses for ordaining various people to the ministry. So the ordination of a deacon, the ordination of a priest, the ordination of a bishop. Um, so those are those are services that are in there. And there are various things that are in there. So there's the, uh, the marriage services in the prayer book. Um, and there's various services for ministering to the sick uh, uh, or for uh, performing other kinds of things. Uh, so those are corporate worship, okay? The prayer book also contains a calendar and various tools for how to calculate the dates of holy days, and Easter, and other feasts. So you can orient yourself according to the liturgical year, which uh, Emily's told us about last week. And so the prayer book has some keys and some tools in there um, to help you know where you are in the liturgical year. Um, it contains a whole number of various kinds of prayers for various circumstances. Um, so the prayer book has, I don't know, hundreds of little specific prayers here in the section called prayers and thanksgiving. So those are prayers that can be quite useful in certain circumstances. The prayer book also contains uh, lectionary, and there are two different lectionaries in most prayer books. There is a prayer book, uh, excuse me, it's just a general lectionary that is for Sunday services. And so this here, the lectionary, year A, B, and C, that's a table that tells you, hey, these are the texts that we're going to read in church um, on each Sunday throughout the year. And then there's also a daily office lectionary. This is the last thing in the prayer book. And the daily office is for every day of the year. So you'll have certain readings for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and that splits the, the Bible up. I don't think the lectionary covers the entirety of the Bible. It covers a lot of the Bible. And if you use the morning and evening office, and you read the scriptures that we read at church on Sunday, um, over the course of our, the three-year cycle, you will get the bulk of the scriptures into your life. So this is a way of splitting that up. Um, and sometimes, often, uh, the prayer book comes bound with the book of Psalms, the Psalter, is often in the prayer book because the Psalms are important parts of many, many of these um, services and offices that are in the prayer book, and it's handy to have those Psalms in there. Um, so for the most part, if you're going to be praying according to the Anglican tradition, doing daily devotions, doing services in the Anglican tradition, if you've got a Bible and you've got a prayer book, you should have everything that you need about how to, how to do this, how to do services. All right. So, um, yeah, so we've got all kinds. And, and different prayer books, 
um, I brought several different editions, of course. They're, they're organized slightly differently, right? Because there's different editions, and so when you're looking in the contents of the prayer book um, that you have, you might find them in slightly different order or slightly different labels, um, but it should be the same kinds of material. Um, so I wanted to, we're, we're going to go over some very particular things, and I've got some pictures of the prayer book. I hope it's going to be a little clearer, but you can, if you have a copy of the prayer book, you can look it up yourself, and I've got several. You're welcome to take a look at them after the fact. Um, but before we get to the, the sort of inside of the prayer book, um, I like this quote here. I like to talk about why why do this. Um, there, are, there are a lot of traditions. I've spent some time in traditions that see sort of fixed prayer and sort of scripted, organized prayer as, as like cheating maybe, I guess is a generous way of putting it, right? Um, that sort of think, well, if I'm, not, if I'm not authentically praying my own words, then somehow I'm just engaging in empty ritual, right, to need to be sort of heartfelt, sort of a romantic sort of idea. Um, and I've got some sympathy for that, right? Scripted prayers can be rote, and scripted prayers can sort of lead to a sort of a spiritual dryness where I'm just going through the motions and not engaging the gears of my heart. But I think scripted prayers can have very, very significant benefits as well. Um, and this quote, C.S. Lewis, you know, patron saint of Anglicans everywhere, Soon until his, we get the C.S. Lewis feast day. That's is that next month, in case of you know. So, yeah, so so in another month we'll have a C.S. Lewis feast day, and maybe I'll remember this quote then. Um, Lewis wrote a letter to a friend about you know why do we do this? Right? Why do we have fixed services, fixed prayers? And he says this: the advantage of a fixed form of service is that we know what's coming. Extempore public prayer has this difficulty: we don't know whether we can mentally join in it until we've heard it, right? It might be phony or heretical. We are therefore called upon to carry on a crucial devotional activity at the same moment, two things that are hardly compatible. In a fixed form, we ought to have gone through the motions before in our private prayers. The rigid form really sets our devotions free. Also, find the more rigid it is, the easier it is to keep one's thoughts from straying. Also, it prevents getting too completely eaten up by whatever happens to, the, to be the preoccupation of the moment, that is war or election or whatnot. The permanent shape of Christianity shows through. I don't see how the ex tempe method can help becoming provincial, and I think it has a great tendency to direct attention to the minister rather than to God. And I think there's some great wisdom in here, particularly in the sense that um, if we are praying together from a prayer book, that has been written and authorized, we know that those prayers are good prayers. We know that those prayers are solid theological prayers that we can join in with wholeheartedly. And we know that if we're following the strictures of, a, of an authorized prayer book, we're not in the moment, right? We are in the historic church, and there's always things in the moment that are gonna distract us and that seem very, very, very important right here, right now. And the prayer book orients us to a much larger horizon that says these, these are important things. Stay on this path, right? And you're not going to be caught up in the, 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 the moment. You're going to be caught up in the church. So I, I sincerely believe that the prayer book is a deeply powerful, maybe not the singular form of devotion. Uh, it's a great one. I've been... Uh, I, I use the, the morning office. I'm pretty faithful with the morning office because I've developed this sort of habit to do that. And it's just been re revelatory in my life to pray that sort of regular prayer every morning. Um, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the pragmatic things, practicalities. I do not have a clock here. I don't know how, how on time or not on time I am. Okay, okay. we're good. We got, we got time. Um, so I want to talk about sort of like what's in the prayer book. So the prayer book sometimes can be intimidating if you look at it and you're not accustomed to prayer book because there's lots of weird stuff in there and it's kind of peculiar. Um, the first sort of typographical piece um, to point out how the prayer book works is the prayer book has um, the prayers themselves and it has what we call rubrics. Um, and the rubrics are basically just little instructions about how to use the prayers. Um, they're called rubrics because they used to be printed in red ink in the book. And the word rubric comes from the Latin word for red. Okay. Impress your friends and family with a little trivia. Um, but in modern prayer books, the rubrics tend to be in italics. Um, and so this is from, um, I actually don't remember where I pulled this from. Um, but you can see, you got the lesson, you've got this is, 
you know, the, the, the non-italic text is what, what is said in the service, but the italics sort of give some instructions. You know, there's one or two lessons as a point to the rhythm, the reader first saying, and here's what the reader says, a reading from, okay? Um, and so you've got these rubrices, those are important to, to sort of tell what the instructions are, and often they're sort of, um, you know, more robust rubrices that go on in here. Right, silence may be kept, one of the following canticles can be said, if this, then that. So the rubrices can be, can be sort of complicated. There's a couple of other pieces of sort of typography. Um, sometimes within the liturgy itself, there's gonna be these little italics and that's where you can kind of adjust the language for the proper situation. So this is from the baptismal liturgy. It says these persons, but you can say this person, right? You can kind of adjust for the proper situation. Um, there, are, there are bits where you can, there's a blank, I think in this, this last slide, right? So sometimes there's blanks because, okay, you put the, the proper lesson right in here. In the baptismal liturgy, there's a blank for the, uh, the baptized name. You can put the name in there. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens in the prayer book, um, there's, a, there's a line that runs along the margin here. And those are bits of the service that are optional, that can be left out of the, of the service um, if necessary. And so this is from the baptismal liturgy, and this is the bit where if there's more than one, right? But if there's only one, right, you don't have to read the bit with the line. Um, and usually that's fairly intuitive, what are the bits and pieces that can be sort of left out. Um, the other thing, I didn't put a, I didn't put a slide up here for this because we do this in our bulletin all the time, but there's often asterisks in the prayer book, especially in the Psalms, and the, those are, those are pause points. So the asterisk being, this is the part where there's a, there's a, there's a pause in the liturgy, right? It's the middle of the verse sometimes. Um, and you get used to those bits of typography as you get more accustomed to the prayer book, how it functions and how you use it. The prayer book bit that is most, and, and that I found most helpful is the daily office. It's a beautiful little um, kind of faux medieval stained glass window here to illustrate the point that um, fixed hour prayer, right? Prayer that happens regularly at certain parts of the day is a long-standing Christian tradition. Um, in the Middle Ages, um, there were a cycle of, I think it was seven fixed hour prayers that go through the course of the day. They're fixed at certain times of the day. Um, and in the, the more modern tradition, in the prayer book, those are, those are reduced in number. And there are, if you want the full experience of fixed hour prayer, I don't think I would encourage anyone to jump into like fully trying to do all of the prayers if you haven't done it before. Um, but there are four um, daily prayers that are in the, um, the prayer book. Um, so there's morning prayer, and morning prayer is, is intended to be prayed in the morning. Um, I think it's a good idea to do it the first thing that you do in the morning. That's kind of the attention to get up, and the first thing you do is you're in the scriptures and you're praying. Um, so I do this more or less first thing in the morning. You also have a service called midday prayer, and that is intended to be done in the middle of the day. Um, I know a number of people who use the midday prayer liturgy during their lunch break, for instance, so when you have a time in the middle of the day to reorient yourself, that's where midday prayer is. There is also evening prayer. Evening prayer is intended to be done sometime uh, like after work, right? supper time, that kind of thing. And then there is a service called Compline. And Compline is, is a beautiful service that is intended to be done before you go to bed, right at the end of the day. Um, and so those, those four services together are the daily office. Um, and as I said, you can, if, you, if you're, I don't know, a superstar daily office person, you can do all four of them. I don't know anyone, I think, that, that authentically does all four daily office prayers every single day. Um, and if you're gonna start and you're gonna do the whole thing, you're probably gonna disappoint yourself because it's, it's, it's hard, right? And, um, if you're if you're novice at sort of fix our prayer, if you're novice at using the daily office, start with one, right? Start with one of these offices that's going to work in your schedule, um, where you've got time, where you feel God calling you, and get accustomed to that. I will be frank, I, I pray the morning office 90% of the time, 
and very seldom do I use the other daily offices because my life is relatively busy. Maybe, and maybe I should, it's possible, I should pray more. In fact, it's, it's absolute, I should pray more. Um, but I say that as a sense that, you, you know, as much as you can, right, this is, this is gonna be valuable to you as much as you can, right? And the habit of praying at a certain time every day is transformative in your life, or has been for me. So we've got the daily office. There's also in the prayer book um, a shortened office um, that is for families. And so if you have a family with small children, or if you simply want an abbreviated form of the liturgy that you can use corporately, um, there's a shorter form um, that is intended for family. I think it's mostly for families with small children, but it's certainly acceptable for families with large children or families without children or various other sorts of groups of people. Uh, it's an abbreviated sort of form of the liturgy. Um, I would like to talk briefly, so there, there's something else, and we do this in church, we have collects. So one of the things that you'll find as you pray through the daily office is occasionally, um, there will be a bit that says, oh, okay, now pray the collect of the day. So the collect of the day is the next thing in the morning office or in the, in the, in the prayer. Um, and you have to go to a different part of the prayer book to find the collects. They're organized there by the liturgical year, and sometimes special days have special collects. Um, and that's why a lot of prayer books have, like, ribbons like this. And so you put your one ribbon in where the collects are, and you put your one ribbon in the Psalter where you're at, and you can kind of flip back and forth for the bits that you need. But the collects are scripted prayers, and they're assigned for each week of the year, each particular um, circumstance in the year, so I think we're in proper 24, because it says in the prayer book it's closest to October 19th. So this would be the proper for this, this is the collect for this week, okay? Um, and then there are certain collects for particular days, so the, the nearest sort of, I don't know, special commemoration day in the prayer book is the, the commemoration of St. James of Jerusalem, which is coming on October 23rd, is that tomorrow? I forget what day today is. Um, and so that, there's, a, there's a particular collect for that day. And there are also certain collects for certain particular uses. And so a collect of time of um, crisis or things like that. So the collects are there. Those are prayers. And they are inserted into the daily office. And you've got to kind of find them in the other bit of the prayer book. Okay. Um, and then there are scripture readings in the daily office. And the scripture readings are... Oh, actually... This is not the script readings. I forgot I had this slide in the middle. This is the slide where you can tell where the occasional uh, services are. So this is from, uh, this is October. And so there's James of Jerusalem on the 23rd. So this is, uh, I apologize that you can't see this. Maybe Jeremiah, we can put these slides up in the, in the, in the place so you can kind of see what it is. Or you can actually look in the prayer book because this is just a picture of a page from the prayer book. Um, but you got a chart here, and this is October, and there's the day, and you can see which are the days that have special collects or special commemorations, right? And then there's some optional ones, and there's some other things. Um, what you'll find, uh, what I find, and I, I'm a historian, so I'm nerdy about this, is every once in a while I'll be like, oh, like, you know, who is, you know, Samuel Isaac Joseph, the Bishop of Shanghai, right? Who's got a commemoration in the prayer book. And it leads me to go like, oh, I've learned something new and interesting today because I didn't know about this guy. Um, so the commemorations, that's where you find them. There is also bits where you say the scripture of the day. And so this is a, a screenshot from the Daily Office Lectionary. The Daily Office Lectionary goes on two year cycle. And so odd numbered years are year one, because one is odd, and even numbered years are year two, because two is even. And they're on facing pages, and this is, so you know, here's the week, 26, and Sunday, you got some psalms. The first line is always psalm readings. There's always psalms in the daily office. Um, and so they don't have to put psalms, you just presume. There's always a psalm. And then there is, uh, a uh, Old Testament reading. There is a non-gospel New Testament reading, reading from the New Testament outside the gospel, and there is a reading from one of the gospels. So every prayer office, you get a psalm, you get some Old Testament, you get some New Testament, and you get some gospel. Um, and there, there's a whole 
kind of structure to this. I don't know who puts together these lectionaries. I find them brilliant sometimes, where the, the passages that are assigned for the particular day work together in interesting ways and complement one another. I don't know if that's on purpose or just the work of the Lord as I'm, as I'm going through there. Um, and over the course of you know uh, months and years, you make your way through various books because the, the lectionary typically puts you through one book and you kind of run through that book at a time. Um, so that's where you're gonna find the scriptures. So, you, so when you're praying the, the office, and we're gonna do this next Sunday, that's the plan for next Sunday, is we're gonna kind of do this together and get a sense of how that all works. But when you're praying the office, you've got the basic skeleton the structure of the daily office, and then you gotta find the proper college for the day, and you gotta find the proper scriptures for the day, and insert those into the bits where they're supposed to be. Um, and it sounds complicated when I say it like that, but it's actually quite straightforward when you're doing it in practice. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to say is the um, occasional prayers. So um, the, the prayer book has all kinds of um, extra prayers. I, I don't know why I chose these, except maybe I'm particularly concerned for the future of the human race. Um, but there's there's prayers for all kinds of things, um, and there's there's a bunch of them there. You, there's an index for them. Um, so if you if you need to pray for it, we don't need to pray for it because we're experiencing it right now. Um, but there's a there's a prayer for that, and you can use those occasional prayers both singularly if I'm like man, you know, I need to pray for rain, or if I have a friend that is in some kind of crisis and I don't know what to do, the prayer book has a prayer for that. Um, and they're very, very handy. They're short, they're scripted, they're beautiful, um, and they're worth, they're worth using. Um, so those are our occasional prayers. I want to point out uh, two more things, very briefly. Am I close to time? I can't see the time for me. And then I will take some, some questions. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions, because I'm told that we need to strictly conclude by 10.30. Um, so I would encourage, if you're interested in the prayer book, um, I encourage you to go out and get a copy for yourself. They're not expensive, um, and in fact, I will tell you this, if you want a prayer book and you do not have the money to buy a prayer book, I will buy you one, or Jeremiah will buy you one, or the church will buy you one. We will get you a prayer book if you want to have one. Um, but they're fairly, fairly easy to obtain, and it's nice to kind of have that physical, tangible book. Nevertheless, they are also online in their entirety, all of the various prayer books. Um, and so if you are very digitally minded, if you like your Kindle better than your, your particular pages, I would be mystified by that, but um, those are available. So I put some links in the bottom of the notes. I know you can't like push the paper, um, but they're not hard to find. You can get each edition of the perfect available online in beautiful, like perfectly rendered PDFs. So it looks just like the book. Um, so that's that. The other thing that I would recommend, and this is, I use this for my, for my morning devotions, um, is I use a, it's a podcast app, it's the Daily Office podcast. Um, Andrew Russell, who is, it's just a great sort of leader for this. Um, and I put the link to that there, I think if you just search your podcast finder for Daily Office podcast. And he does morning prayer and evening prayer. And you just listen to the podcast and follow along in the prayer book. And it's both a way to orient yourself, because he knows what he's doing. And as you're working through the prayer book with a leader that knows kind of what's going on, it helps you orient to the prayer book, and it is also a way to have a real tangible sense that I am praying this office with the church at large, because there's lots and lots of people with this, and it's a little different, at least for me, it's a little different to pray the morning office when I'm listening to the podcast of leader call and respond sort of thing, than if I'm trying to pray the office all by myself in the quiet of my, of my study or whatever I'm doing. Um, because there's a, there's a communal aspect to common prayer that seems to me to come forth better if I'm doing it with this podcast. And I think there are other tools of recordings of prayers, and I'm sure people have different things. That one is what I use and I like, so I want to point that out um, for everybody. I would love to take questions. I think we got about 12 minutes. Right? At the end of the Psalms, there's... Mm -hmm. Praise be, glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was mm -hmm. in the beginning, and now, and will be forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen, yeah. Why after each song? That's, um, I, I don't know why that particular phrase after each song. That's a very traditional, very old sort of um, portion of prayer. Um, and there are um, sort of um, 
scripted responses to the readings that, that if you go through the prayer work daily office, you'll sort of be accustomed to. Um, I don't actually know the origin of that particular one. Um, often they're from the Bible, so sometimes the Magnificat or the Nunc Dimittis, which are some of the great hymns from the book of, oh, it's Luke, right? Am I gonna embarrass myself by being the wrong book? I'm pretty sure it's Luke. Um, so those will be those responses. That response, the best I can say is it is a very old and traditional piece of response at the end of the psalm. So it's okay if I skip it in my reading? Uh, I will, well, I'm going to say this. Um, it's okay if you skip anything in your... <laughs> um, like I said, this is not a magical talisman that you have to use exactly as it is, right? Like I said, I think it's it's helpful to be guided by the structure in the book and have some guardrails that are put in there by you know, the wisdom of the, of the ages. Um, but this is not an authoritative text that you can't deviate from or, or skip things from. No. I was going to mention uh, the Dwell app now. I think they added it in the last mm -hmm. year that we have free access to parish. They have just the scriptures on there now. Oh, oh keep, keep to the... Yeah. Yep. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and it's, re you can, it's nice to have those read if you, you know... Oh, yeah, that's, that's then brilliant. One of the apps I have, you can um, kind of curate your own. You can mix up morning, midday, mm -hmm. and select and do it all. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's great. And could you maybe remind us, I, I, it's been a while since the Dwell app came out. We, so this is, it's a, it's a, it's an app that Advent will, so we have a, Robin, do you want to tell us sure. what this is? <laughs> Hi guys, we have a subscription that the church pays for. If you want to um, get the app, you can go to So get in touch with Robin if you are interested in the Dwell app. Um, I've also found an app called Venite that okay. just runs through all of it. Okay, you great. Can, you can choose different parts and you can you edit it to them. your to your heart's content. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I'm wondering, are all these prayer books going back to Cranmer's original ones? Are they all? Do they all contain the same scriptures and art like? So historically, um, across time, the readings and the lectionary have changed and have adjusted. So we are not using the same lectionary that they used in the 17th century. Um, across space, I believe most, not just Anglican churches, but most, um, at least for the Sunday lectionary, most Protestant churches that use a lectionary use something called the Revised Common Lectionary. Um, so we're we're using the same scriptures as our sort of Lutheran and you know Methodist brothers that have this that use the same lectionary kind of across space. Now, that's of course not universal, um, but so that that's my is that what you're asking? I I I don't actually know, Jonathan. Maybe yeah yeah. They use so, the revised common lectionary. Yeah so. Okay. Um, it is, the Revised Common Lectionary is, is very, very broadly used for, for churches that have um, and, liturgies. And in this 1979 version, do they use a certain uh, translation of the scripture, like Revised? Yeah, yeah. So the 79 prayer book, I believe, uses the Revised Standard Version of the scriptures that it has in, in, within the prayer book. Um, the 2019 prayer book, I know, uses the ESV which is the same version of the Bible that we use for our scripture readings. Um, and I believe the Psalms, the Psalter in both prayer books is, is, a, is a bespoke translation of the Psalms. It is not from one of the other biblical translations. I believe it is the Coverdale Psalter um, or a addition or, or variant of the Coverdale Psalter. That's a great question. I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna put my picture back up there. So, um, that's a great question. The the NIV tends to be in use among 
more non-liturgical context. So it wouldn't surprise me if there were not NIV prayer books. But fixed hour prayer is, is becoming very common even among what I might call low church or free church persons. So it is possible. And there's lots of prayer books. I mean, the, I, this is the Book of Common Prayer, and that's our kind of Anglican prayer book. But um, I, I have this prayer book, which is kind of a non-denominational prayer book. Um, that I like quite a bit, and there's a whole bunch of different prayer books on the market that are probably keyed with different kinds of scriptures and different kinds of um, habits of prayer. So, Mr. Historian, when Cranmer started his uh, prayer book, mm -hmm. what did he use? I mean, you said there was the Latin from the Catholic Church. So, my real question, Rob, what I'm getting at is, where did it really all start? Where's the earliest form of like the prayer book, the lectionary, where did it all come from? Well, okay, so ultimate origins are, are larger than our time remaining today. But, um, so there were um, Latin prayer books in use in England in the immediate pre-Reformation era. There's a, there's a great book out there by a guy named Eamon Duffy um, called The Stripping of the Altars, if you're really interested in this stuff, where he talks about all the kind of devotional paraphernalia that was in use, and Kramer used a lot of that. But Kramer was also a scholar. He was, I can't remember if he was Oxford or Cambridge, but he was a scholar before he became the Archbishop, and he traveled around in uh, continental Europe, and so he was influenced by the Lutheran liturgy that was developed by Martin Luther, the German mass that Luther developed, and he was also deeply influenced by the Latin Vulgate. He did a lot of his own translation. So the Cranmer's prayer book, there's a lot of like inputs to Cranmer's prayer book because Cranmer was a broad-minded scholar. Um, so I, I don't know if that's directly answering your question. Well, I was really wanting to go back further, but you're right, it's probably not the right yeah. thing. Like where did, so the, the Catholic Church, the original yeah, yeah. Roman Church, somehow all this, um, idea of you know lectionary and and propers and all that stuff that we have in here. I'm just really curious about the origins of like I'm talking about maybe this century or yeah. I would I would assume that it goes even earlier than that. Okay. Um, I think there are um, so Philippians chapter two is often understood by scholars to be something like a fixed prayer that was used in various churches. Um, of course, that's, that's, that involves some scholarly supposition, but it, it, there's a good argument to be made that among the very earliest Christian churches, there were forms of prayer that were shared among the churches, um, probably not in the same formal structure um, that we use now, but I think fixed hour prayer and fixed sort of common prayers go back quite a bit further than the Were those part of the Jewish tradition as well in terms of worship in the synagogue and the life of a... I yeah, there are, there are fixed prayers in, in Judaism as well. I, that's that's a little outside of my area of expertise, but I, I, I'm i pretty confident. I hear, I hear people saying yes. Probably know <laughs> <what I mean. laughs> the uh, 1928 traditional version, it's almost uh, 400 years after the original and it's American, what were the distinctives about what gen yeah. what caused them to want it? Was it just, we need to put it into American English, or was it something? So some of it is just is, is sort of American vernacular English, but some of it is, um, so the prayers include prayers for the king, and in the American prayer book, it was <laughs> prayers for the president. Uh, and some of it is, is just that the, um, the Episcopal Church in the United States was sort of becoming its own entity, much the same as the, the ACNA prayer book, right? As, it, as the church was institutionally distinct from the Church of England, they, they put their own prayer book together. And it's like Kenya, right? The church in Kenya put its own Kenyan prayer book together. That's, that's one of the glories of the prayer book is that it, it's, a, it's a, uh, a skeleton that you can put your own clothing on. That's a weird metaphor, I don't like that. <laughs> you know, sometimes you start a metaphor and by the time you finish it, you're like, ah, that was not really good. So I think uh, I see Jeremiah approaching, uh, and I'm happy to answer various questions, but I believe we are at our time. I think so. But um, please come back next week and we'll put this to practice and we'll participate in morning prayer. I also just want to champion as a literary professor, uh, Kramer's intentionality with the scriptures he, he grasped together. Listen for the echoes in, in, in our worship this morning. 
one of my favorite examples is he grabs the Tower of Babel with Pentecost, right? The Lord confounding speech because the enterprise is antithetical to the things of God and then the use of every tongue, tribe, and nation speech to advance the gospel. Kramer's very intentional about seeing those three lines through scripture. And once you get a vision for that, we'll read something. What was it? A couple weeks ago, we had talked about the, the Red Sea and then we have Paul talking about, right, deliverance. And so very intentional and it's beautiful once you capture um, his, his prayerful imagination at work. I'll close this in prayer and we hope to see you next week. Thanks for being here, for your patience with the technology. Heavenly Father, thank you that you transcend <laughs> the towers of Babel and the wireless microphones, and that you speak to your people through servants like Cranner, through uh, the priesthood of all believers, through your Holy Word, the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Um, thank you for Rob and just his attentiveness to the way that you have revealed yourself. Um, guide us as we head to worship now in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks.